it means we must also rethink that if this new deal is going to help everybody, yes, it must genuinely be green, but it should also be inclusive, which makes me transition in the final point on the issue of industrialization. I am also happy to be here because last uh, January 2008, I was privileged to be the keynote speaker at the African Union Summit. It was an important time that, you know, I was invited. The topic was industrialization and diversification of African economies. I say to you what I said to my, our heads of states, our fathers in Africa. I said, today, you and us are addicted to the commodity boom. Because at that time, everything was high. There's high demand for raw materials everywhere. I say, be careful. The issue is, can you use this new attention, this new wealth, to diversify your economies, as the Norwegians and others have done, as the Botswanans are trying to do? Will this commodity boom help you now diversify and create wealth? Create wealth, I emphasize. We talk a lot about poverty alleviation. When I go to Asia or Brazil, I don't hear them talking a lot about poverty alleviation. They talk about competitiveness, growth, and wealth creation so that they can fight poverty. But I said to the heads of state, we talk about poverty alleviation. We don't talk enough about the means to do it, the need for competitiveness, and for us to be part of a global trading system so we lift ourselves out of poverty. But we must create wealth. You cannot fight poverty without creating wealth. It is not possible. Wealth through diversification of economies, particularly moving into higher value products. Our economies have been dependent on commodities for a long time. If it is not cocoa, it is coffee, it is cotton. I say sometimes that yes, we treat oil and gas and iron ore almost as how we did with cocoa. We pick the cocoa from the tree, we dry it and we export. Now we ship the oil and gas out. We don't even ask if we have access to energy for the very people who are exporting it. For you who are businessmen, and for those of us in the development system, we must also ask the question, how do we help these economies establish the roads, the infrastructure, the access to energy, so that in fact they can transform their economies into other productive activities? For example, manufacturing. Paul Collier and his team, Vanables and others have helped us with our industrial development report. 2009. We address this in detail. So I just give you snapshots. They've gone into the economics of this. What needs to be done? What kind of public policies need to be put in place to help countries diversify? Those who are resource rich, but those who are also not resource rich. I will not bore you with some of the other details. Others have talked about governance uh, uh, already, so that's already uh, uh, covered. But yes, the governance is needed. Strong leadership, visionary leadership, I give you an anecdote. When I came into government, I, was, I used to be a professor then at Michigan State University, teaching agribusiness. And a few months after coming into government, we wanted to renegotiate one of the mining deals. I came in, you know, having friends who had worked for Winrock International, a number of environmental agencies. And one of the professors, my senior colleagues I admired most, used to deal with resource economics. So I saw this as a wonderful opportunity to apply what I had learned in America. So we set up a committee to renegotiate. And we said, but how do we open this thing? It's already signed. Look at what they're doing in the community. It's one of the worst kind of mining. They move the village people. They start digging and then they flood. Then they move the village people to another location, more and more to the marginal lands. And then I remembered, as an as a undergraduate student, I helped to organize a demonstration once. Because one of the companies I said, oh, we have all these big holes and lakes. We can also use it to store chemical wastes. So for me, it was time to give back. And so we set up this committee. My gosh, talk about negotiating power. We were little guys in this committee. And these guys flew in the best guys from outside. Lawyers and everything, including former ambassadors. And there we were, you know, myself, a PhD, and two others, and then everybody else. They hired the best lawyers in the city. Next thing, they started putting articles in papers. So I said, don't worry. We call our environment friends as well. I'll call some friends in the U.S. to back us up. The long and short of the story is we could not even do it. Four months later, the whole discussion was dead. 
the powers that be had pulled levers enough and everybody backed off. We were even worried that the government will be overthrown. Let me tell you, that's how serious it was. Yes, His Excellency did not talk about negotiating power, but it is important. Therefore, my, my message being, corporate social responsibility is important. We live in the same world. When others are exploited and the environment is destroyed and they have no hope, they do bad things. They do very bad things. The world will not be stable. The world will not be stable. In 1990, when my country was listed for the first time by a BBC documentary as the poorest in the world, I say impossible because we have gold, iron ore, titanium, you name it. We cannot be the poorest. But they labeled, you can go back and check their archives, they labeled the documentary Trade Slaves. Trade Slaves. Because it was in the trade arrangement, the deals that we had made by previous governments. His Excellency was very modest to talk and, and humble to talk about the good work his predecessors did that he built on. But sometimes when you're locked into a bad deal, you get stuck. Mrs. Johnson Sirleaf, our new US president, to try to renegotiate a deal like you did, Excellency, she called for more help. So corporate social responsibility, the same standards in mining and resource exploitation elsewhere in more advanced countries must be applied also to poorer countries. Otherwise, we are creating the problems of tomorrow. I say to my friends in Europe, if you don't look down south more seriously at us, our grandchildren will come up north. There is no other choice. There will be no jobs. We will migrate. Sorry, they will migrate. I will not be around them. This is why the whole approach to poverty alleviation must be about creating wealth and hope down south. And business is important. Business is important in that. So once again, this charter is most welcome. Question is, how do we make it operational? What happens next? I want to pledge my readiness to work with you guys. Because for me, this is giving something back. This is giving something back. Let's give it legs. Let's have it discussed in Africa with the corporates and with the governments, with civil society. Let us bring it within UN fora. Whatever I can do to, send, to do that. Because when I look at this charter, the, the Extractive Industries Transparency Act, the Kimberley process, we are now having a, a number of pillars that will say to the world, hey, let us see how we are exploiting natural resources in poorer countries. As we talk about a Green New Deal, as we talk about economic recovery and rethinking business practices, let us think about also some of what you have in the, in the, in, in the posters about ethics, about good business practices that will in fact make this world a safer place, but an inclusive process of globalization that benefits all, both rich and poor, and in fact prevents more crisis and saves the climate. Thank you very much.